I didn't think of myself in that character as someone who hated. I had to think of myself as someone who loved and that her hate comes out of um, a deeply misplaced fear and an anger. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Ashley Atkinson is an actor. She sat down with me on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to talk about the work. When you land the role, how do you begin the process of inhabiting? I have to admit to being a little childish about it in that uh, I tend to do the first read after I've gotten it as a complete fan read just like so excited Mm -hmm. about it and like these are the characters that are going to be in this world and this is the world that I'm going to get to be in and this is going to be like I'm going to say this and it's just a pure pleasure read you know Um, uh, and it's a devouring like it's definitely something that like I'm sort of hunched over like an animal reading (laughs) this script, just consuming and sort of taking ownership of it to a certain degree. And then I go back and uh, it all, that is all something that depends on the role. I feel I was Meisner trained. I'm Meisner trained. I went to the neighborhood playhouse. There are certain things that I can't know about a character until we're doing it. Mm. I was trained in a largely collaborative environment. Uh, But what I do start to do uh, is think about what things I know. You know, what I say about uh, myself, what I say about others, and what is incontrovertibly true about that character. Uh, And you can, like, go through and mark that up. You know what I mean? Mm Mm-hmm. But also, I love, there's this idea that my friend Josh Baton, I'm doing a TV show called One Dollar for CBS All Access, and Josh Baton is one of the best actors I've ever met in my entire life. He's insanely talented. And he talks about the thing you get for free. And so I think it is interesting to think about what I get for free with a character. And also where I diverge from what I see in the script or what I think was the plan. You know, Mm -hmm. like, uh, for example, Connie Kendrickson was a very, uh, originally a very conventionally attractive, put together picture of like better homes and gardens, suburban femininity. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting that... I got to embody that character and so I thought well what do I what do I bring to that and I thought okay I'm I'm pretty warm as an individual Um, I was like and I like nurturing people I like being kind and I was like oh won't that be fun to be a thing that she can turn on and off like a faucet Mm. you know that like we see her be warm from the very beginning, but that's because she's dealing with a certain sort of person. Mm-hmm. And that that warmth is, um, is changeable and disruptive. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about your character in Black Clans, but yeah. just, to, just so people know. But wait, let me go back to something you just said, what you get for free. I mean, yeah. t- tell me what that means though. So uh, Josh has this idea about what you get for free. Like for example, um, with someone like uh, Topher Grace, you get a certain amount of what I would call like a clean pleasantness. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? It's just like something that, that the actor doesn't have to uh, do. Yeah, it it's comes just with something it. Yeah. you get it for free with that person. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Like my buddy yeah. Phil Ettinger is a really. Um, He's like such a handsome young man in his 30s and could play really conventional stuff. But there's something for a, uh, a uh, sort of straight leading man guy. He's got this um, 
vulnerable, feminine, almost femininity to him that I think that he has naturally. And so he likes taking roles where he's able to sort of play against the type of character that he's assigned and allow that femininity to come in in a way that I think people find really attractive and unnerving in equal measure. But yeah, what you get for free is just uh, is sort of the content of the actor themselves. I got you, I got you, yeah. You just said something there that I found interesting. How do you feel confident or, 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 or um, have enough agency to look at Connie and say, I'm gonna add in my, my kindness Right? You, I, I think mm-hmm. that, that was a word. Warmth, I think. Was warmth, word. warmth, warmth. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, you said... Which is a weird thing to say about yourself, but... I'm no, I, but I, <laughs> I get it, I get it, I get it. But, but I, 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 every, every time I'm hearing an actor talk, I think about what I, what I would do, and I would be paralyzed initially, thinking, I can't put anything in it. I have to find out what's there to play it. Mm-hmm. You, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But... That's going to, that leads to a wall, perhaps. Sure. So the question is this, where does that confidence come from? Or that, that ability to, to, to mold the, the part in that way and to add that in? Because I saw that, I saw what you're talking about in the performance. You know, I mean, I, mean, I so I mean, it's, it's there and it became alive because of that, I think. If it's going to be me, then just the way that I read something is going to be very different from the way another actress would read something, which is sort of uh, something that I understood very well as a child when I was uh, doing children's theater, and then I lost for a while. Uh, My mother tells a story about how I got into the car when I was nine, I think, uh, and she and doing you know auditioning for a school play. She said, "Well, what do you think?" And I said, "Well, I did my best, and they either want a me or they don't want a me." <laughs> and I, and she loves this story. Um, and that's something I think I lost track of in the sort of song and dance of the desperation of early years, you know, eating at art openings and trying to right. desperately to get anyone right. to say boo to you. Um, but I think every character is different. Some of them, I just see it in the language and I know it in the relationships and I just know what I want and I know how to get what I want. But that's really all that it comes back down to is sort of behavior. What am I looking for? What do I need? Uh, Is there anyone I'm protecting? That's always a big Mm. sort of thing for me is who am I taking care of? Who do I think I'm taking care of? Mm -hmm. Connie's warmth was something that I discovered because she loves these men. She loves these men and she doesn't I didn't think of myself in that character as someone who hated. Mm -hmm. I had to think of myself as someone who loved and that her hate comes out of um, a deeply misplaced fear Mm -hmm. and an anger. Spike said something kind of great to me. When I went in for the audition, I was like, dude, (laughs) she's terrible. She's the worst which is really not something I should even entertain saying about a character but like I just felt so ill about her and he laughed at me and he said she just fell in love with the wrong guy Uh (laughs) and I was like well I don't think that's true you know I think that that sort of lets her off of the hook right in this way um that I wasn't ultimately interested in doing sort of like taking away her agency right. in a way that I didn't think, and I don't think he thought was helpful. Right. Um, but it was sort of like giving permission to myself 
as Ashley to go like, okay, so let's find let's find the heart of her. Right. He wanted you to back away from the terror yeah. of her. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because ultimately that's I think that's unplayable. Right. You know? Right. Uh, someone like Connie because I've played roles before that just felt so much like me that I just could find what I wanted and what what uh, clues I could discover from the text and just go. Mm -hmm. And those are sort of just, um, you know, little gimmies, which are delicious and fun. But Connie was something that was someone that I actually actively had to work and use tools (laughs) to be, which is great. Like that doesn't, you know, uh, my career has not been full of those necessarily up to this point. There have been some, but What were some of those tools? Uh, A lot of them are Meisner stuff. Uh So like uh, uh, substitution Uh was a thing that was really helpful for me. Um, There is that bedroom scene uh, with my husband, Jasper Pakonen, and myself. And we are talking about murdering black people. And I had to actively find a substitution because I couldn't... I had to be so excited about it, you know? Mm -hmm. I had to be focused on the goal and in love and enthralled to this, to this man and to our plan. And I couldn't just be, I couldn't just be in love with him. It had to be the feeling of taking a huge leap. And so, (laughs) because I'm, a working actor in, in New York, uh, I made it about buying a house. <laughs> like, I'm literally thinking about buying a house in that entire scene. It's all about, you know, oh, gosh, do you think we're making the right choice buying a house? I mean, we've thought about buying a house for so long, and now we're finally going to do it. I love you so much, you know? And, uh, and then sort of some of the rage moments um, I did directly the opposite. There were things where I needed to feel really threatened, um, where I needed to feel like the fabric of things that I hold dear is being threatened. And that feels very personal to me Mm -hmm. in the America of 2018, you know, that there are, rights and protections and loves of people that feel very uh, under siege Mm -hmm. at this point. And um, so that stuff felt a little easier to access. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had done this 10 years ago, maybe it wouldn't be as easy to access. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very true. I guess auditioning has changed. There's no longer maybe a, a table in the middle of the room right. anymore. No, I like the table in the you middle do. of the room. You do. I'm going to take a guess and say you're a master at auditioning. I enjoy auditioning. I, I sense that. I think this is what I meant. I wouldn't I don't say know. I have mastered it. I don't yeah. even know what that looks like, I, right? I, but I, like, I do yeah. like it. So to me, if you, if you like it, you've conquered it, right? I mean, because I mean, it seems like most people don't like it. But if you like it and you treat it like it's like a little bit of your work, it's like yeah, a little it's a work bit. Session. It's a work session. That's that's more than half the, the battle probably for for it, right? I mean. Yeah, I think so. I, I you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, God rest his soul, said a wonderful thing that I always sort of keep in mind, which is any day that you are acting in a room that you didn't pay for yeah. is a good one. And so uh, I've started to, and this has been a process, um, I've started to come into rooms to work mm-hmm. as opposed to be tested. Yes. And that feels really good because I can relax. I can meet someone on the ground as an equal and we're both just trying to solve this puzzle together. You know, and we're both just trying to unlock something. And there are directors that are great about meeting you in that space. Mm. You know, I've had some really, really great directors. Because 
far from mastering auditions, I have definitely um, really screwed the pooch on some of them and then been allowed to keep working until something unlocks. Mm -hmm. And like, that's a huge gift. I was just thinking about, uh, I did a play that Cynthia Nixon directed two years ago. And it was one of those scenes where these two characters are just sort of um, talking about what seems like really innocuous stuff. And then my character bursts into tears, like a torrent of, of uncontainable tears. Um, and I just didn't get there. I said it was a real swing and a miss, you know? And I'm not going to fake cry in a yeah. room that just seems like the most horrific, degrading thing to do in an audition room is to fake cry. Um, but she, of course, as an actor, was like, oh, okay. It was, she treated it as if it wasn't a failing of mine, but uh, something to attack mm. and go, okay, so how do we give you the runway mm. to make that happen? Yeah. Which is great because then you go like, oh, it's not me. I'm not a terrible actor yeah. that should have her card revoked and That's such be a great back analogy down. too. It's like the runway was too short. Yeah. It wasn't the plane. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's so cool. The plane is functioning perfectly yeah. fine. You just, you're functioning like a, like a human. We're just not giving you what you need for that humanness. And it really just sort of... And then you become active in solving it yeah. together. And it's such a relief to not feel like a failure in that moment, you know? Um, and then we ended up working together. I ended up getting that gig and we did that play and it was really fun. And that moment felt really good because we figured out how to solve it. And do you think that that was, like there's no way for you to know this, but do you think that that was the way she works with everyone or did, or did she see something in you that n she knew that you could do it? Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I think she's, uh, I think it's probably more like how she is. I think she has a natural warmth and empathy towards people to the point where she could not give me a direction for this character who was dying of cancer, my character. I could not receive a direction from her for about three weeks without both of us just literally welling up with tears in the middle of this audition room. She'd like walk into the space and she'd be like, so when you say this to him, why doesn't he know about this appointment already? Shouldn't he's your best friend? Shouldn't he have been there? And then we would both just be like, mm -hmm. and then she'd go, okay. And then she'd like walk away and we'd do it again. It was incredible. But I love, I love directors that um, play for teams, you know? Yes. Uh, I think one of the things that both Craig Zobel and Spike Lee have in common is that they are great. JD, JD Washington called Spike recently a player's coach. And I think that is absolutely correct. And Craig Zobel is also a player's coach. Uh, when I did compliance with Craig like six, seven years ago, I remember we had these early rehearsals with Dreema Walker and Ann Dowd and myself, and it was just the three of us. And we walked in and we sat down and Craig said, and I mean, the balls of this, he said, I don't know if this is possible. Right. He said, I wrote it, but I don't actually know if it's possible. I don't know if we can actually go from A to B to C to D to E to what they actually did. That's so interesting that he said that. Yeah. Because I think that movie's a miracle movie. It, I mean, you guys all it's performed insane. a miracle. I mean, Anne Dowd, like, that was a master class. Yes, yes. Watching her work yeah. was one of the most extraordinary experiences I've ever had on a set. Was that your initial, the beginning of your relationship with Craig? Now, now, yes. now you're in this new show. 
Mm-hmm. Is he and he's directing it, right? I mean, yeah, he got you into this, or was it? Yeah, yeah, he's directing all ten episodes. Uh, yeah, compliance. I just came in. I knew Homestar Runner, which he had had a part in uh, that comic, and so I came in and I really thought, once again, I thought I flubbed that audition. Like I was sort of feeling um, low energy that day and I went in and I remember very clearly calling my manager at the time. I was also young, like I was 31 years old, I guess. Um, And I said, "Uh, I know, (laughs) sorry, the arrogance of this is very funny to me. I said, I know what he wanted me to be and I could not be it and I'm really sorry. (laughs) Which is so ridiculous. First of all, the (laughs) idea that you would know what someone else needs from you yes. it's just whatever um but i did and i felt very strongly about like the fact that i had failed it and i had just you know and he thinks that's very funny um so i worked with him on compliance and then he just sort of this job happened he started doing this show for cbs all access and they were sort of creating this world and craig and allison estrin who was doing the casting for it here in New York and also cast compliance uh, and I all went out uh, one evening and they sort of broached the topic with me and they said right now it's four episodes out of ten uh, it's not a series regular it's it's recurring it's four out of ten but I don't know I and Craig said but I don't know we keep seeming to write more for her she just becomes more and more and he's like and I'm really excited about you playing this and so these four episodes that Craig initially pitched me on, I think we're entering episode nine now, and I know uh, that that's an episode I'm in, and I'm pretty sure I'm also in episode 10, which will then bring the total to nine out of 10 episodes. Wow, that's cool. That's that cool. I have uh, a role in. And it's been really, really, really fun. Also, we're in Pittsburgh, so we get to uh, be in that space, and we're all creating this family. It's a really great group of people, like just that's cool. A yeah. really great group, and Craig's uh, exceptional at bringing together this sort of troop feeling. Yeah. So there was no audition. There was no. I didn't go to CBS. I didn't test. I didn't do any of that. Isn't that I just nice? got to join. It's nice and terrifying. Um, Tell me what you mean by that. Well, it's it's nice uh, because you feel very free and very valued, you know, and it feels great and collaborative like you're just going with your friends to make a thing. Um, it can be scary if you allow um, that inner critic to ever take hold because it's very easy, I hate to even talk about it, but it's very easy to go down that road of like, oh God, he must have remember, thought I was a better actor than I actually <laughs> am, and he thought I was right for this thing, and I'm not, you know, like you, you can right. allow those demons to sort of get a hold of you if you let them. So you have to be pretty vigilant about that sort of thing. And maybe they wouldn't be there if you proved yourself in an audition? Yeah, cause like, you know, especially if you're doing a smaller role, um, what you show them in the audition, in something like television that moves very quickly, yeah. uh, what you show them in the audition is what they wanna see in the callback, is what they wanna see when you walk onto set. Mm-hmm. Unless you're having a conversation already about those things being different, you've already shown them what your take is. Right. And so you kind of need to go and deliver that. The other thing I saw you in was F to 7th. Oh, yeah. Because I saw Women Who Kill last year. Uh, and Ingrid then I was like indeed. blown away. And then I just went, yes. went and saw all this. And, yeah. She's so smart. But that's my kind of comedy, you know, like that. I guess my question is, are you ever asked to do something or you get a script and you can kind of see what it's going for, but it's not, it's not new comedy. It's like old comedy or it's like, do you know what I mean? And, yes. and so you're like, so is there a, this battle in you? Like, 
I guess I gotta give them that because, but it's not that funny. I don't do those jobs. Because a lot of it also, like, if it's old comedy, the place that they've carved out for me in it is not a good spot. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, if it's, um, you know, I've been asked to be one of the girls in a montage of bad blind date door slams. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's where that goes. The, The space that I can occupy in comedy that punches down is... Um, not anything I'm really interested in doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, F to seventh was really fun. I- Ingrid is so smart. Uh, she sort of pitched me on this idea. I met her at an NYU thing, and uh, because I'd been working with another uh, director named Aaron Greenwell on a movie called My Best Day uh, that went to Sundance, uh, and so I met Ingrid, and we were talking about this idea she had about being what she fondly called an aging lesbian and like what does that mean in this sort of new sort of uh, spectrum based identity view in someone who had found a lot of comfort in a binary what happens you know (laughs) and so she pitched me this character and she started talking about the episode where we go to a party thrown um by an individual who's trans. Yeah, yeah. And I said, oh, God, no, I think like the trans community needs our support. I don't think they need me saying idiotic stuff about them. And she said, and so, so rightly, she said, oh, Ashley, no one's going to think you're right. Like, that's <laughs> not who this character right, is. Right. You're an ass. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And so once that happened, that I was, um, that I lose every interaction, that I'm never the smartest person in the room in these characters, it's really fun to do. Um, what about when you're opposite somebody who isn't getting what you're doing comedy wise, whether it's improv mm-hmm. or just not placing the thing so you can hit it right? Uh, I've never really felt responsible for anyone else's work like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And I've never felt an obligation more to the joke than to the honest response of what I'm getting in the room. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, the joke is not the joke. Uh, What matters is what am I getting from this person? And how do I... That We talk about the pinch and the ouch in Meisner. So what is the pinch and what is my ouch? You know, and if the joke ends up getting left in the dust because of that pinch and that ouch, then either... Um, we need to go back and work. Adjust the pinch. Yeah, adjust the pinch, adjust the ouch, but that's not my job. To right. Do. You know right. what I mean? I'm, because God knows I'm not trying to put my, my objectives above anyone else, like an actor brain trying to accomplish their objectives. Right. I think the conflict and the tension and the getting a pinch that you don't expect that isn't the pinch you wanted is actually a huge gift. It makes you like have to live in that tension of like, yeah. of like ill-fitting shoes, you know, of like, right. no, but I didn't, no, you know? And sometimes I think that's a delicious thing yes. to happen. Is there something you can do or want to do that people don't know you can do in this business? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, um, I'm at a point where I'm really interested in uh, telling stories. It's starting to um, help develop stories that I'm really interested in. Um, I have three things that are uh, sort of three treatments that I've uh, tasked myself with pitching at least 12 times before the end of the year. 
um, to our films, one as a pilot. Uh, I've written plays a lot. I've had plays uh, performed and put up, produced. Um, to take that, to get over the intimidation <clears throat> of the camera uh, and say, and as I've gone along and, and become more familiar with the technical aspects of that to say, okay, I can do this. I was sort of residing in play world because I understood the mechanics of it. It seemed a lot simpler to me, but what you can achieve in film and TV is really exciting. So to adapt that language and to start telling stories is really important to me. And that's, I think, sort of the next step. I also think that we're in a really interesting time where someone like me 20 years ago really had to manage their expectations about what they were going to be allowed to do in this industry. And I see people like Anne and Margot Martindale and Freddie McDormand and all of these actors that uh, as I get a little older and some of my younger friends my and my sort of ingenue based friends are getting really nervous, I'm getting to a place where I'm getting to do more and more and more and deeper and more interesting and intimate characters and I just feel like there's a trajectory that I'm really excited about and that I have options. It will be a really nice side effect um, and I do mean side effect of uh, Black Klansmen if the opportunities I get become more nuanced or that I find myself in a position where I can create opportunities for myself and for other people and thereby amplify their experience. Ashley Atkinson, thank you so thank much you. for this. It was a real pleasure. Really appreciate this. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project.